The Dayak or Dayak or Daya are the native people of Borneo. It is a loose term for over 200 riverine and hill dwelling ethnic subgroups, located principally in the central and southern interior of Borneo, each with its own dialect, customs, laws, territory, and culture, although common distinguishing traits are readily identifiable. Dayak languages are categorized as part of the Austronesian languages in Asia. The Dayak were animist in belief, however, many converted to Islam and since the 19th century there has been mass conversion to Christianity. History The Dayak people of Borneo possess an indigenous account of their history, mostly in oral literature, partly in writing in Papan Terai wooden records, and partly in common cultural customary practices. Among prominent accounts of the origin of the Dayak people is the mythical oral epic of Tedak Tatum. By the Naju Dayak of central Kalimantan, it narrates that the ancestors of the Dayak people descended from the heavens before moving from inland to the downstream shores of Borneo. The independent state of Nansarunai, established by the Maanyan Dayaks prior to the 12th century, flourished in southern Kalimantan. The kingdom suffered two major attacks from the Majapahit forces that caused the decline and fall of the kingdom by the year 1389. The attacks are known as Nansarunai Usak Jawa, meaning, the destruction of the Nansarunai by the Javanese, in the oral accounts of the Maanyan people. These attacks contributed to the migration of the Maanyans to the central and south Borneo region. The colonial accounts and reports of Dayak activity in Borneo detail carefully cultivated economic and political relationships with other communities as well as an ample body of research and study concerning the history of Dayak migrations. In particular, the Iban or the Sea Dayak exploits in the South China Seas are documented, owing to their ferocity and aggressive culture of war against sea dwelling groups and emerging Western trade interests in the 18th and 19th centuries. In 1838, British adventurer James Brooke arrived to find the Sultan of Brunei fending off rebellion from warlike inland tribes. Sarawak was in chaos. Brooke put down the rebellion, and was made governor of Sarawak in 1841, with the title of Raja. Brooke pacified the natives, including the Dayaks, who became some of his most loyal followers. He suppressed headhunting and piracy. Brooke's most famous Iban enemy was Lebo. Rentap. Brooke led three expeditions against him and finally defeated him at Sadak Hill. Brooke had many Dayaks in his forces at this battle, and famously said, "...only Dayaks can kill Dayaks. So he deployed Dayaks to kill Dayaks." Sharif Masher, a Melanau from Mukha, was another enemy of Brooke. During World War II, Japanese forces occupied Borneo and treated all of the indigenous peoples poorly. Massacres of the Malay and Dayak peoples were common, especially among the Dayaks of the Kapit Division. In response, the Dayaks formed a special force to assist the Allied forces. Eleven U.S. airmen and a few dozen Australian special operatives trained a thousand Dayaks from the Kapit Division in guerrilla warfare. This army of tribesmen killed or captured some 1,500 Japanese soldiers and provided the Allies with vital intelligence about Japanese held oil fields. Coastal populations in Borneo are largely Muslim in belief, however, these groups Tiding, Banjaris, Bulungan, Passer, Kutainis, Bakumpai are generally considered to be Malayized and Islamist native of Borneo and heavily amalgated by the Malay people, culture and sultanate system. These groups identified themselves as Malayu or Malay subgroup due to the closer cultural identity to the Malay people, compared from the Dayak umbrella classification, as the latter are traditionally associated for their pagan belief and tribal lifestyle. 
The Dayak people classification are largely limited among the ethnic groups traditionally concentrated in southern and interior Sarawak and Kalimantan. Other native groups in dwelling in northern Sarawak, parts of Brunei and Sabah, chiefly the Bisaya, Orang Ulu, Kadazandasan, Melanau, Rungus and dozens of smaller group were categorized under a separate classification apart from the Dayaks due to the difference in culture and history. Other groups in coastal areas of Sabah and northeastern Kalimantan, namely the Alanan, Taoshog, Sama and Bajau, although inhabiting and in the case of the Taoshog group ruling the northern tip of Borneo for centuries, have their cultural origins from the southern Philippines. These groups though may be indigenous to coastal northeastern Borneo, they are nonetheless not Dayak, but instead are grouped under the separate umbrella term of Moro, especially in the Philippines. Ethnicity <inaudible> 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 The term Dayak was coined by Europeans referring to the non-Malay and non-Muslim inhabitants of central and southern Borneo. There are seven main ethnic divisions of Dayaks according to their respective native languages which are 1. Naju 2. Apo Kayan part of their sub-ethnic groups are known as Orang Ulu along with other smaller sub-ethnic Dayak groups in Malaysia. 3. Iban C. Dayak or Heban 4. Bidayu Land Dayak or Clematon 5. Murat 6. Punan 7. Oat Danum Under the main classifications, there are dozens of ethnics and hundreds of sub-ethnics dwelling in the Borneo island. There are over 50 ethnic Dayak groups speaking different languages. This cultural and linguistic diversity parallels the high biodiversity and related traditional knowledge of Borneo. Topic: Languages. Dayaks do not speak just one language, even if just those on the island of Borneo, Kalimantan, are considered their indigenous languages belong in the general classification of Malayo-Polynesian languages and to diverse groups of Bornean and Sabahan languages including Land Dayak, and the Ibanic languages of the Malayic branch. Most Dayaks today are bilingual, in addition to their native language, they are well versed in Malay or Indonesian, depending on their country of origin. Many of Borneo's languages are endemic which means they are spoken nowhere else. It is estimated that around 170 languages and dialects are spoken on the island and some by just a few hundred people, thus posing a serious risk to the future of those languages and related heritage. <laughs> Headhunting and peacemaking In the past, the Dayak were feared for their ancient tradition of head-hunting practices the ritual is also known as Neo by the Dayaks. Among the Iban Dayaks, the origin of head-hunting was believed to be meeting one of the morning rules given by a spirit which is as follows The sacred jar is not to be opened except by a warrior who has managed to obtain a head or by a man who can present a human head, which he obtained in a fight, or by a man who has returned from a sojourn in enemy country. Often, a war leader had at least three lieutenants called Monik Sabong who in turn had some followers. The war rules among the Iban Dayaks are listed below. If a warleader leads a party on an expedition, he must not allow his warriors to fight a guiltless tribe that has no quarrel with them. If the enemy surrenders, he may not take their lives, lest his army be unsuccessful in future warfare and risk fighting empty-handed war raids The first time that a warrior takes a head or captures a prisoner, he must present the head or captive to the warleader in acknowledgement of the latter's leadership. 
If a warrior takes two heads or captives, or more, one of each must be given to the warleader, the remainder belongs to the killer or captor. The warleader must be honest with his followers in order that in future wars he may not be defeated There were various reasons for headhunting as listed below For soil fertility Dyaks hunted fresh heads before the paddy harvesting seasons after which a head festival would be held in honor of the new heads. To add supernatural strength which Dyaks believed to be centered in the soul and head of humans. Fresh heads can give magical powers for communal protection, bountiful paddy harvesting and disease curing. To exact revenge for murders based on blood credit principle unless Adat Pati Nyawa customary compensation token is paid. To pay dowry for marriages, e.g., Durian Palat Mata. Eye blocking dowry for Ibans once blood has been splashed prior to agreeing to marriage, and, of course, new fresh heads show prowess, bravery, ability, and capability to protect his family, community, and land. For foundation of new buildings to be stronger and meaningful than the normal practice of not putting in human heads. For protection against enemy attacks according to the principle of attack first before being attacked." As a symbol of power and social status ranking where the more heads someone has, the more respect and glory due to him. The warleader is called Tuai Sarang warleader or Raja Barani king of the brave while Kao Anak small raid leader is only called Tuai Kao raid leader whereby Adat Tabalu widow or rule after their death would be paid according to their ranking status in the community. For territorial expansion where some brave Dayaks intentionally migrated into new areas such as Muja Bua Raya or migrated from Skrang to Paku to Kanoat while infighting among Ibans themselves in Batang I caused the Ulu I Ibans to migrate to Batang Kanyao River in Kapis, Kalimantan and then proceed to Katibas and later on Ulu Rajang in Sarawak. The earlier migrations from Kapis to Batang I, Batang Luper, Batang Saribas, and Batang Creon rivers were also made possible by fighting the local tribes like Bukatan. Reasons for abandoning headhunting are peacemaking agreements at Tumbong Anoy, Kalimantan in 1874 and Kapit, Sarawak in 1924. Coming of Christianity, with education where Dayaks are taught that headhunting is murder and against the Christian Bible's teachings. Dayaks' own realization that headhunting was more to lose than to gain. Among the most prominent legacy during the colonial rule in the Dutch Borneo present-day Kalimantan is the Tumbong Anoy Agreement held in 1874 in Damang Batu, central Kalimantan the seat of the Kahayan Dayaks. It is a formal meeting that gathered all the Dayak tribes in Kalimantan for a peace resolution. In the meeting that is reputed taken several months, the Dayak people throughout the Kalimantan agreed to end the headhunting tradition as it believed the tradition caused conflict and tension between various Dayak groups. The meeting ended with a peace resolution by the Dayak people. After mass conversions to Christianity, and anti-headhunting legislation by the colonial powers was passed, the practice was banned and appeared to have disappeared. However, it should be noted that the Brook-led Sarawak government, although banning unauthorized headhunting, actually allowed NAO headhunting practices by the Brook supporting natives during state-sanctioned punitive expeditions against their own fellow people's rebellions throughout the state, thereby never really extinguished the spirit of headhunting especially among the Iban natives. The state-sanctioned troop was allowed to take heads, properties like jars and brassware, burn houses and farms, exempted from paying door taxes and in some cases, granted new territories to migrate into. 
This Brooks practice was in remarkable contrast to the practice by the Dutch in the neighbouring West Kalimantan who prohibited any native participation in its punitive expeditions. Initially, James Brooke the first Raja of Sarawak did engage the British Navy troop in the Battle of Betting Maru against the Iban and Malay of the Saribas region and the Iban of Skrang under Rentap's charge but this resulted in the public inquiry by the British government in Singapore. Thereafter, the Brooke government gathered a local troop who were its allies. Subsequently, the headhunting began to surface again in the mid-1940s, when the Allied powers encouraged the practice against the Japanese occupation of Borneo. It also slightly surged in the late 1960s when the Indonesian government encouraged Dayaks to purge Chinese from interior Kalimantan who were suspected of supporting communism in mainland China and also in the late 1990s when the Dayaks started to attack Madaris emigrants in an explosion of ethnic violence. After formation of Malaysia, some Iban became trackers during the Malayan emergency against the communist insurgency and thereafter they continue to be soldiers in the armed forces. Headhunting resurfaced in 1963 among Dayak soldiers during the confrontation campaign by President Sukarno of Indonesia against the newly created formation of Malaysia between the pre-existing Federation of Malaya, Singapore, Sabah and Sarawak on 16 September 1963. Subsequently, Dayak trackers recruited during the Malayan emergency against the communists' insurgency wanted to behead enemies killed during their military operations but disallowed by their superiors. It should be noted headhunting or human sacrifice was also practiced by other tribes such as follows Toraja community in Sulawesi used Adat Ma Barada human sacrifice in Rambu Solo ritual which is still held until the arrival of the Hindi Dutch which is a custom to honor someone with a symbol of a great warrior and bravery in a war. In Gomo, Sumatra, there were megalithic artifacts where one of them is Batu Panking. Beheading stone on which to tie any captive or convicted criminals for beheading. One distinction was their ritual practice of head hunting, once prevalent among tribal warriors in Nagaland and among the Naga tribes in Myanmar. They used to take the heads of enemies to take on their power. Topic: <laughs> Agriculture, land tenure, and economy. Traditionally, Dayak agriculture was based on actually integrated indigenous farming system. Iban Dayaks tend to plant paddy on hill slopes while Malo Dayaks prefer flat lands as discussed by King. Agricultural land in this sense was used and defined primarily in terms of hill rice farming, ladang garden, and hutan forest. According to Professor Derek Freeman in his report on Iban agriculture, Iban Dayaks used to practice 27 stages of hill rice farming once a year and their shifting cultivation practices allow the forest to regenerate itself rather than to damage the forest, thereby to ensure the continuity and sustainability of forest use and or survival of the Iban community itself. The Iban Dayaks love virgin forests for their dependency on forests but that is for migration, territorial expansion and or fleeing enemies. Dayaks organized their labor in terms of traditionally based land holding groups which determined who owned rights to land and how it was to be used. The Iban Dayaks practice a rotational and reciprocal labor exchange called Bedarok to complete works on their farms owned by all families within each longhouse. The ''Green Revolution'' in the 1950s, spurred on the planting of new varieties of wetland rice amongst Dayak tribes. To get cash, Dayaks collect jungle produce for sales at markets. With the coming of cash crops, Dayaks start to plant rubber, pepper, cocoa, etc. 
Nowadays, some Dayaks plant oil palm on their lands while others seek employment or involve in trade. The main dependence on subsistence and mid-scale agriculture by the Dayak has made this group active in this industry. The modern-day rise in large-scale monocrop plantations such as palm oil and bananas, proposed for vast swathes of Dayak land held under customary rights, titles and claims in Indonesia, threaten the local political landscape in various regions in Borneo. Further problems continue to arise in part due to the shaping of the modern Malaysian and Indonesian nation-states on post-colonial political systems and laws on land tenure. The conflict between the state and the Dayak natives on land laws and native customary rights will continue as long as the colonial model on land tenure is used against local customary law. The main precept of land use, in local customary law, is that cultivated land is owned and held in right by the native owners, and the concept of land ownership flows out of this central belief. This understanding of adat is based on the idea that land is used and held under native domain. Invariably, when colonial rule was first felt in the Kalimantan kingdoms, conflict over the subjugation of territory erupted several times between the Dayaks and the respective authorities. <inaudible> <inaudible> Religion and festivals The Dayak indigenous religion has been given the name Kaharingan, and may be said to be a form of animism. The name was coined by Jilak Rewat in 1944 during his tenure as a Dutch colonial resident in Sampit, Dutch East Indies. In 1945, during the Japanese occupation, the Japanese referred Kaharingan as the religion of the Dayak people. During the new order in the Suharto regime in 1980, the Kaharingan is registered as a form of Hinduism in Indonesia, as the Indonesian state only recognizes six forms of religion i.e. Islam, Protestantism, Roman Catholicism, Hinduism, Buddhism and Confucianism respectively. The integration of Kaharingan with Hinduism is not due to the similarities in the theological system, but due to the fact that Kaharingan is the oldest belief in Kalimantan. Unlike the development in Indonesian Kalimantan, the Kaharingan is not recognized as a religion both in Malaysian Borneo and Brunei, thus the traditional Dayak belief system is known as a form of folk animism or pagan belief on the other side of the Indonesian border. Underlying the world view is an account of the creation and re-creation of this Middle Earth where the Dayak dwell, arising out of a cosmic battle in the beginning of time between a primal couple, a male and female bird, dragon serpent. Representations of this primal couple are amongst the most pervasive motifs of Dayak art. The primal mythic conflict ended in a mutual, procreative murder, from the body parts of which the present universe arose stage by stage. This primal sacrificial creation of the universe in all its levels is the paradigm for, and is re-experienced and ultimately harmoniously brought together according to Dayak beliefs in the seasons of the year, the interdependence of river upstream and downstream and land, the tilling of the earth and fall of the rain, the union of male and female, the distinctions between and cooperation of social classes, the wars and trade with foreigners, indeed in all aspects of life, even including tattoos on the body, the layout of dwellings and the annual cycle of renewal ceremonies, funeral rites, etc. The best and still unsurpassed study of a traditional Dayak religion in Kalimantan is that of Hans Scherer, Naju religion, the conception of God among a South Borneo people, translated by Rodney Needham The Hague, Martinus Nijhoff, 1963. 
The practice of kaharangan differs from group to group, but shamans, specialists in ecstatic flight to other spheres, are central to Dayak religion, and serve to bring together the various realms of heaven upper world and earth, and even underworld, for example healing the sick by retrieving their souls which are journeying on their way to the upper world land of the dead, accompanying and protecting the soul of a dead person on the way to their proper place in the upper world, presiding over annual renewal and agricultural regeneration festivals, etc. Death rituals are most elaborate when a noble kaming dies. On particular religious occasions, the spirit is believed to descend to partake in celebration, a mark of honor and respect to past ancestors and blessings for a prosperous future. Among Iban Dayaks, their belief and way of life can be simply called the Iban religion as per Jensen's book with the same title and has been written by Benedict Sandin and others extensively. It is characterized by a supreme being in the name of Bunsu Patara who has no parents and creates everything in this world and other worlds. Under Bunsu Patara are the seven gods whose names are, Sengalang Barong as the god of war and healing, Bhikkhu Bunsu Patara as the high priest and second in command, Menjaya as the first shaman Manang, and god of medicine, Salampandai as the god of creation, Sempalong Gana as the god of agriculture and land along with Semaruga, Ini Inda, Aini, Andan as the naturally born doctor and god of justice and Andamara as the god of of wealth, the life actions and decision making processes of Iban Dayaks depend on divination, augury, and omens. They have several methods to receive omens where omens can be obtained by deliberate seeking or chance encounters. The first method is via dream to receive charms, amulets, pingaro, empalias, or medicine obot, and curse sumpa, from any gods, people of Ponga Libo and Jalong and any spirits or ghosts. The second method is via animal omens barong laba, which have long-lasting effects such as from deer barking which is quite random in nature. The third method is via bird omens barong bisa, which have short-term effects that are commonly limited to a certain farming year or a certain activity at hands. The fourth method is via pig liver divination after festival celebration at the end of critical festivals. The divination of the pig liver will be interpreted to forecast the outcome of the future or the luck of the individual who holds the festival. The fifth but not the least method is via nampak or batapa self-imposed isolation to receive amulet, curse, medicine or healing. There are seven omen birds under the charge of their chief Sengalang Barong at their longhouse named Tansang Kenyalang Hornbill Abode, which are Katupong Jalo or Kake or Entis Rufus Piculet as the first in command, Baragai Scarlet Rumped Trogan, Pankas Maroon Woodpecker on the right-hand side of Sengalang Barong's family room while Bajampong Crested Jay as the second in command, Embuas Banded Kingfisher, Kelabu Papa, Senabong, Deard's Trogan, and Nendak, White Rumped Shama, on the left-hand side. The calls and flights of the omen birds, along with the circumstances and social status of the listeners, are considered during the omen interpretations. The praying and propitiation to certain gods to obtain good omens, which indicate God's favor and blessings, are held in a series of three tiered classes of minor ceremonies: Badara, intermediate rites, Gawa or Niming, and major festivals, Gawe, in ascending order and complexity. Any Iban Dayak will undergo some forms of simple rituals and several elaborate festivals as necessary in their lifetime from a baby, adolescent to adulthood until death. The longhouse where the Iban Dayak stay is constructed in a unique way to function as for both living or accommodation purposes and ritual or religious practices. Nearby the longhouse, there is normally a small and simple hut called Langkau Ampan, Sukor forgiveness, thanksgiving hut built to place offerings to deities. Sometimes, when potentially bad omens are encountered, a small hut is quickly built and a fire is started before saying prayers to seek good outcomes. 
Common among all these propitiations are that prayers to gods and or other spirits are made by giving offerings, peering, certain poetic lekka main and animal sacrifices, genselen, either chickens or pigs. The number lekka or tarun of each peering offering item is based on ascending odd numbers which have meanings and purposes as below. Peering three for peering ampen mercy or saluwik wastefulness spirit. Peering five for peering minta request or bajalai journey. Peering seven for peering gawe festival or bujang barani brave warrior. Peering nine for sangkong including others or turu leftover included. Peering contains offering of various traditional foods and drinks, while genselen is made by sacrificing chickens for bird omens or pigs for animal omens. Badara is commonly held for any general purposes before holding any rites or festivals during which a simple miring. Ceremony is done to prepare and divide peering offerings into certain portions followed by a Sampi Ngau Bebi Al prayer and cleansing poetic speeches. This most simple ceremonies have categories such as Bidara Matak held at the Longhouse family Bilek room, Bidara Mansau performed at the family Ruai gallery, Barunshor cleansing carried out at the Tanju and River, Minta Ujan Tauka Panis request for rain or sunniness. The intermediate and medium-sized propitiatory rites are known as Gawa, ritually working with its main highlight called Niming, poetic incantation that is recited by Lamambong bards besides miring ceremonies. This category is smaller than or sometimes relegated from the full scaled and thus costly festivals for cost savings but still maintaining the effectiveness to achieve the same purpose. Included in this category are Sandao Ari. Midday ritual held at the Tanju veranda, Gawe Matak, unripe feast, Gawa Niming Tua, luck feast, and Chaba Arang, head feast, and Gawa Timang Bainta Intu, life caring feasts. The major festivals comprise at least seventh categories, which are related to major aspects of Iban's traditional way of life, i.e., agriculture, headhunting, fortune, health, death, procreation, and weaving. With paddy being the major sustenance of life among Dayaks, so the first major category comprises the agricultural related festivals, which are dedicated to paddy farming to honor Sempalong Gana, who is the deity of agriculture. It is a series of festivals that include Gawe Batu, Whetstone Festival, Gawe Nalika Tana, Soil Plowing Festival, Gawe Bena, Seed Festival, Gawe Njemali Umai, Farm Healing Festival, Gawe Mata, Harvest Initiation Festival, and Gawe Basampan, Paddy Storing Festival. According to Derek Freeman, there are 27 steps of hill paddy farming. One common ritual activity is called Mudas, making good any omens found during any farming stages, especially the early bush clearing stage. The second category includes the headhunting related festivals to honor the most powerful deity of war, Sengalang Barong, that comprises Gawe Barong Bird Festival and Gawe Amat, Asal Real, Original Festival with their successive ascending stages, with most famous one being Gawe Kenyalang Hornbill Festival. This is perhaps the most elaborate and complex festivals which can last into seven successive days of ritual enchantation by Lamambong bards. It is held normally after instructed by spirits in dreams. It is performed by Tuai Keo raid leader called Bujang Barani leading warriors and war leader Tuai Sarang who are known as Raja Barani bravery king. In the past, this festival is vital to seek divine intervention to defeat enemies such as Bakitan, Ukit and Kayan during migrations into new territories. 
With the suppression of headhunting, the next important and third category relates to the death-related rituals among which the biggest celebration is the Soul Festival to honor the souls of the dead especially the famous and brave ones who are invited to visit the living for the Sibayan to feast and to bestow all sorts of helpful charms to the living relatives. The Raja Barani brave king can be honored by his descendants up to three times via Gawai Antu. Other mortuary ceremonies are, Besarara Bungai, flower separation held three days after burial, and Gedas Ulit morning termination, Barantu Gawai Antu or Gawai Gelambang entombing festival. The fourth category in term of complexity and importance is the fortune-related festivals which consist of Gawai Pangkong Tiang post-banging festival after transferring to a new longhouse, Gawai Tua luck festival with three ascending stages to seek and to welcome lux, and Gawai Tajou jar festival to welcome newly acquired jars. The fifth category consists of the health-related festivals to request for curing from sickness by Menjaya or any Andan such as in Gawai Sakit sickness festival which is held after other smaller attempts have failed to cure the sick persons such as Bagama touching, Bilian various Manang rituals, Basugi Sakit to ask Kelling for curing via magical power and Baranong Sakit to ask for curing by Sengalang Barong in the ascending order. Manang is consecrated via an official ceremony called Gawai Babangan, Manang Consecration Festival. The shaman Manang of the Iban Dayaks have various types of pelian ritual healing ceremony to be held in accordance with the types of sickness determined by him through his glassy stone to see the whereabouts of the soul of the sick person. Besides, Gawai burring can also be used for healing certain difficult to cure sickness via magical power by Sengalang Burong, especially nowadays after headhunting has been stopped. Other self caring ritual ceremonies that are related to wellness and longevity are Niming Bulu, hair adding ceremony, Niming Sukat, destiny ceremony, and Niming Below Ayu, life bamboo ceremony. The sixth category of festivals pertains to procreation. Gawai Lalabi River Turtle Festival is held to pray to the deity of creation called Salampadani, to announce the readiness of daughters for marriage and to solicit a suitable suitor. This is where those men with trophy head skulls become leading contenders. The wedding ceremony is called Mela Penang Arika nut splitting. The god of creation Salampandai is invoked here for fertility of the daughters to bear many children. There is a series of ritual rites from birth to adolescence of children. The last and seventh category is Gawai Ngar cotton dyeing festival, which is held by women who are involved in weaving pua kumbu for conventional use and ritual purposes. Ritual textiles woven by Iban women are used in the bird festival and in the past used to receive trophy heads. The ritual textiles have specific Ankarumba anthropomorphic motifs that represent Igi Balang trophy head, Tiang Ranyai shrine pole, cultural heroes of Ponga and Jalong, deities and Antu Jurasi demon figure. Over the last two centuries, some Dayaks converted to Christianity, abandoned certain cultural rites and ancestors' practices. All Dayak gods, deity has been labeled as mythology and converted Dayak Christian are not allowed to worship this Dayak's god and deity indirectly making Dayak people had forgotten their original religion and ritual. The Christian Dayak will always honor themselves as first class Dayak while the pagan religious Dayak as second class. Some pagan religion Dayak having difficulties in finding a funeral land when they pass away due to no support from the converted Dayak Association and NGO. Christianity was introduced by European missionaries in Borneo. Religious differences between Muslim and Christian natives of Borneo has led, at various times, to communal tensions. 
relations, however between all religious groups are generally good. Muslim Dayaks have generally retained their original identity and kept various customary practices consistent with their religion. Many Christian Dayak has changed their name to European name but some minority still maintain their ancestors' traditional name. Since Iban has been converted to Christian, some of them abandoned their ancestors' belief such as miring or celebrate Gawai Antu and many celebrate only Christian festivals. An example of common identity, over and above religious belief, is the Melanau group. Despite the small population, to the casual observer, the coastal dwelling Melanau of Sarawak, generally do not identify with one religion, as a number of them have Islamist and Christianized over a period of time. A few practice a distinct Dayak form of Kaharingan, known as Liko. Liko is the earliest surviving form of religious belief for the Melanau, predating the arrival of Islam and Christianity to Sarawak. The somewhat patchy religious divisions remain, however the common identity of the Melanau is held politically and socially. Social cohesion amongst the Melanau, despite religious differences, is markedly tight within their small community. Despite the destruction of pagan religions in Europe by Christians, most of the people who try to conserve the Dayak's religion are local people and certain missionaries. For example, Reverend William Howell contributed numerous articles on the Iban language, lore, and culture between 1909 and 1910 to the Sarawak Gazette. The articles were later compiled in a book in 1963 entitled, The Sea Dayaks and Other Races of Sarawak. <laughs> Society and customs Kinship in Dayak society is traced in both lines of genealogy Although, in Dayak Iban society, men and women possess equal rights in status and property ownership, political office has strictly been the occupation of the traditional Iban patriarch. There is a council of elders in each longhouse. Overall, Dayak leadership in any given region, is marked by titles, a Ponghulu for instance would have invested authority on behalf of a network of Tuai Rumas and so on to a Pamancha, Pengara to Temeging in the ascending order while Panglima or Orang Kaya are titles given by Malays to some Dayaks. Individual Dayak groups have their social and hierarchy systems defined internally, and these differ widely from Ibans to Najis and Benwaks to Kayans. In Sarawak, Temegong Ko Anak Jubang was the first paramount chief of Dayaks in Sarawak and followed by Tun Temegong Juga Anak Barang who was one of the main signatories for the formation of Federation of Malaysia between Malaya, Singapore, Sabah and Sarawak with Singapore expelled later on. He was said to be the ''bridge between Malaya and East Malaysia''. The latter was fondly called a pie by others, which means father. Unfortunately, he had no Western or formal education at all. The most salient feature of Dayak social organization is the practice of longhouse domicile. This is a structure supported by hardwood posts that can be hundreds of meters long, usually located along a terraced river bank. At one side is a long communal platform, from which the individual households can be reached. The Iban of the Kapas and Sarawak have organized their longhouse settlements in response to their migratory patterns. Iban longhouses vary in size, from those slightly over 100 meters in length to large settlements over 500 meters in length. Longhouses have a door and apartment for every family living in the longhouse. For example, a longhouse of 200 doors is equivalent to a settlement of 200 families. The Tuai Ruma longhouse chief can be aided by a Tuai Barong bird leader, Tuai Umai farming leader, and a Manang shaman. 
Nowadays, each long house will have a security and development committee and ad hoc committee will be formed as and when necessary for example during festivals such as Gawai Dayak. The Dayaks are peace-loving people who live based on customary rules or Adat Asal which govern each of their main activities. The ADAT is administered by the Tuai Ruma aided by the Council of Elders in the Longhouse so that any dispute can be settled amicably among the dwellers themselves via Barandao discussion. If no settlement can be reached at the Longhouse chief level, then the dispute will escalate to a more senior leader in the region or Pengulu district chief level in modern times and so on. Among the main sections of customary Adat of the Iban Dayaks are as follows Adat Baruma house building rule. Adat Mela Penang, Butang Ngau Serik marriage, adultery and divorce rule. Adat Baranak child bearing and raising rule. Adat Bumai and Baguna Tana agricultural and land use rule. Adat Neo head hunting rule and adapt Nagintu Antipala head school keeping. Adat Ngasu, Barakan, Njembua and Napping hunting, fishing, fruit and honey collection rule. Adat Tabalu, Ngetas Ulit Ngau Basararak Bungai widow, widower, mourning and soul separation rule. Adat Begawai festival rule. Adat Idup D Ruma Panjai order of life in the longhouse rule. Adat Betanin, Main Lama, Kajit Ngau Taba weaving, pastimes, dance and music rule Adat Beberong, Bamimpi Ngau Betsanaga Ati Babi bird and animal omen, dream and pig liver rule Adat Belalang journey rule the Dayak life centers on the paddy planting activity every year. The Iban Dayak has their own year-long calendar with 12 consecutive months which are one month later than the Roman calendar. The months are named in accordance to the paddy farming activities and the activities in between. Other than paddy, also planted in the farm are vegetables like ensabi, pumpkin, round brinjal, cucumber, corn, lingkau and other food sources like tapioca, sugarcane, sweet potatoes and finally after the paddy has been harvested, cotton is planted which takes about two months to complete its cycle. The cotton is used for weaving before commercial cotton is traded. Fresh lands cleared by each Dayak family will belong to that family and the Longhouse community can also use the land with permission from the owning family. Usually, in one riverine system, a special tract of land is reserved for the use by the community itself to get natural supplies of wood, rattan and other wild plants which are necessary for building houses, boats, coffins and other living purposes, and also to leave living space for wild animals which is a source of meat. Beside farming, Dayaks plant fruit trees like rambutan, longsot, durian, isu and mangosteen near their longhouse or on their land plots to amrk their ownership of the land. They also grow plants which produce dyes for coloring their cotton treads if not taken from the wild forest. Major fishing using the tuba root is normally done by the whole longhouse as the river may take some time to recover. Any wild meat obtained will be distributed according to a certain customary law which specifies the game catcher will the head or horn and several portions of the game while others would get an equally divided portion each. This rule allows every family a chance to supply of meat which is the main source of protein. Headhunting was an important part of Dayak culture, in particular to the Iban and Kenya. The origin of headhunting in Iban Dayaks can be traced to the story of a chief named Sarapo who was asked by a spirit to obtain a fresh head to open a mourning jar but unfortunately he killed a Cantu boy which he got by exchanging with a jar for this purpose for which the Cantu retaliated and thus starting the headhunting practice. There used to be a tradition of retaliation for old headhunts, which kept the practice alive. 
external interference by the reign of the Brook Rajas in Sarawak via Bebanchik Babi peacemaking in Kapit and the Dutch in Kalimantan Borneo via peacemaking at Tumbang Anoy curtailed and limited this tradition. Apart from mass raids, the practice of headhunting was then limited to individual retaliation attacks or the result of chance encounters. Early Brook government reports described Dayak Iban and Kenya war parties with captured enemy heads. At various times, there have been massive coordinated raids in the interior and throughout coastal Borneo before and after the arrival of the Raj during Brook's reign in Sarawak. The Iban's journey along the coastal regions using a large boat called Bandong with sails made of leaves or cloths may have given rise to the term, Sea Dayak, although, throughout the 19th century, Sarawak government raids and independent expeditions appeared to have been carried out as far as Brunei, Mindanao, East Coast Malaya, Jawa and Celebes. Tandem diplomatic relations between the Sarawak government Brooke Raja and Britain East India Company and the Royal Navy acted as a pivot and a deterrence to the former's territorial ambitions, against the Dutch administration in the Kalimantan regions and client sultanates. In the Indonesian region, toplessness was the norm among the Dayak people, Javanese, and the Balinese people of Indonesia before the introduction of Islam and contact with Western cultures. In Javanese and Balinese societies, women worked or rested comfortably topless. Among the Dayak, only big-breasted women or married women with sagging breasts cover their breasts because they interfered with their work. Once Merrick Empong top cover over the shoulders and later shirts are available, toplessness has been abandoned. Metal working is elaborately developed in making mandaus, machetes, parang in Malay and Indonesian. The blade is made of a softer iron to prevent breakage, with a narrow strip of a harder iron wedged into a slot in the cutting edge for sharpness in a process called nambo, iron smithing. In headhunting it was necessary to be able to draw the parang quickly. For this purpose, the mandau is fairly short, which also better serves the purpose of trailcutting in dense forest. It is holstered with the cutting edge facing upwards and at that side there is an upward protrusion on the handle, so it can be drawn very quickly with the side of the hand without having to reach over and grasp the handle first. The hand can then grasp the handle while it is being drawn. The combination of these three factors short, cutting edge up and protrusion makes for an extremely fast drawing action. The ceremonial mandaus used for dances are as beautifully adorned with feathers, as are the costumes. There are various terms to describe different types of dayak blades. The Nyabor is the traditional Iban scimitar, Parang Ilang is common to Kayan and Kenya swordsmiths, Padong is a sword with a metallic handle, and Duku is a multi purpose farm tool and machete of sorts. Normally, the sword is accompanied by a wooden shield called Terabai, which is decorated with a demon face to scare off the enemy. Another weapons are Sanko spear and Sumpit blowpipe with lethal poison at the tip of its laha. To protect the upper body during combat, a gagong armor, which is made of animal hard skin such as leopards is worn over the shoulders via a hole made for the head to enter. Dayaks normally build their longhouses on high posts on high ground where possible for protection. They also may build kuda fencing and kubao fort where necessary to defend against enemy attacks. Dayaks also possess some brass and cast iron weaponry such as brass cannon badil and iron cast cannon miriam. Furthermore, Dayaks are experienced in setting up animal traps petty, which can be used for attacking enemy as well. The agility and stamina of Dayaks in jungles give them advantages. However, at the end, Dayaks were defeated by handguns and disunity among themselves against the colonialists.
Most importantly, Dyaks will seek divine helps to grant them protection in the forms of good dreams or curses by spirits, charms such as Pangaro normally Ponzinus, Empilias weapon straying away, and Enkarabun hidden from normal human eyes, animal omens, bird omens, good divination in the pig liver or by purposely seeking supernatural powers via Nampak or Batapa or Manuntut Ilmu learning knowledge especially Cabal Weapon proof. During headhunting days, those going to farms will be protected by warriors themselves, and big agriculture is also carried out via labor exchange called bedarok, which means a large number of people working together until completion of the agricultural activity. Kalingai or Pontong tattoo is made onto bodies to protect from dangers and other signifying purposes such as traveling to certain places. The traditional Iban Dayak male attire consists of a surat loincloth attached with a small mat for sitting, lalanjang headgear with colorful bird feathers or a turban, a long piece of cloth wrapped around the head, merik chain around the neck, enkaramak ring on thigh and simpai ring on the upper upper arms. The Iban Dayak female traditional attire comprises a short, cane tenon batating, a woven cloth attached with coins and bells at the bottom end, a rattan or brass ring corset, salampai long scarf or merik empong beaded top cover, sugu tingi high comb made of silver, simpai bracelets on upper arms, tumpa bracelets on lower arms and bua pao fruits on hand. The Dayaks especially Ibans appreciate and treasure very much the value of pua kumbu woven or tied cloth made by women women while ceramic jars which they call tajo obtained by men. Pua kumbu has various motives for which some are considered sacred. Tajo has various types with respective monetary values. The jar is a sign of good fortune and wealth. It can also be used to pay fines if some adat is broken in lieu of money which is hard to have in the old days. Beside the jar being used to contain rice or water, it is also used in ritual ceremonies or festivals and given as baya provision to the dead, the adat tabalu widow or widower fee for deceased women for Iban Dayaks will be paid according to her social standing and weaving skills and for the men according to his achievements in lifetime, Dayaks being accustomed to living in jungles and hard terrains, and knowing the plants and animals are extremely good good at following animals' trails while hunting and of course tracking humans or enemies, thus some Dayaks became very good trackers in jungles in the military e.g. some Iban Dayaks were engaged as trackers during the anti-confrontation by Indonesia against the formation of Federation of Malaysia and anti-communism in Malaysia itself. No doubt, these survival skills are obtained while doing activities in the jungles, which are then utilized for headhunting in the old days. Military Dayak war party in proas and canoes fought a battle with Murray Maxwell following the wreck of HMS Alcest. Two highly decorated Iban Dayak soldiers from Sarawak in Malaysia are Temegang Datuk Kanang Anak Langkau and Sergeant Naliga both awarded Seri Palawan Gaga Perkasa and Awung Anak Rawing of Skrang awarded a George Cross. So far, only one Dayak has reached the rank of a general in the military, Brigadier General Stephen Munda in the Malaysian Army, who was promoted on 1 November 2010. Malaysia's most decorated war hero is Kanang Anak Langkau due to his military services helping to liberate Malaya and later Malaysia from the Communists. The youngest of the PGB holder is Asp Wilfred Gomez of the police force. There were six holders of Sri Palawan SP Gaga Perkasa the Gallantry Award from Sarawak, and with the death of Kanang Anak Langkau, there is one SP holder in the person of SGT Nalanu and Orang Ulu. The Dayak soldiers or trackers are regarded as equivalent in bravery to the Royal Scots or the Gurkha soldiers. 
While in Indonesia, Jilak Rewat was remembered as he led the first team of Indonesian National Armed Forces performing a skydiving act on 17 October 1947. The team was known as MN 1001, with 17 October was celebrated annually as a special day for the Indonesian Air Force Paskas, which traces its origins to that pioneer paratroop operation in Borneo. Politics Topic. Kalimantan Organized Dayak political representation in the Indonesian state first appeared during the Dutch administration, in the form of the Dayak Unity Party in the 1930s and 1940s. The feudal sultanates of Kutai, Banjar and Ponchanak figured prominently prior to the rise of the Dutch colonial rule. Political circumstances aside, the Dayaks in the Indonesian side actively organized under various associations beginning with the Dayak League established in 1919 in Banjarmasin, to the Partai Dayak in the 1940s, which serves as an early pan-Dayakism in Indonesia and to the present day, where Dayaks occupy key positions in government. The violent massacre of the Malay sultans, local rulers, intellectuals and politicians by the Imperial Japanese Army during the Ponchanak incidents of 1943–1944 in West Borneo present-day West Kalimantan Province created a social opportunity for the Dayak people in the West Kalimantan political and administrative system during the Ord Lama era in the Sukarno regime, as a generation of predominantly Malay administrator in West Borneo was lost during the genocide perpetrated by the Japanese. The Dayak ruling elite were mostly left unscratched due to the fact that they were then mainly located in the hinterland and because the Japanese were not interested, thus giving an advantage for the Dayak leaders to fill the administrative and political position after the Indonesian independence. In the 1955 Indonesian Constituent Assembly election, the Dayak Unity Party managed to gain 146,054 votes 0.4% of the nationwide vote One seat in the People's Representative Council from West Kalimantan 33.1% of the votes in West Kalimantan becoming the second largest political party after Masjumi. The party attained 9 out of 29 seats in the West Kalimantan Regional Representative Council. 1.5% votes in Central Kalimantan the party managed to obtain 6.9% of the vote in the Dayak majority areas in the province the party was later disbanded after an order by the then President Sukarno that prohibited an ethnic-based party. The members of the party were then continued their careers in other political parties. Ovang Ori joined the Indonesian Party Partai Indonesia, whilst some others joined the Catholic Party Partai Catholic. Among the most prominent Indonesian Dayak politician is Jilak Rewat, a member of Central Indonesian National Committee. He was honoured as the National Hero of Indonesia in 1998 for his major contribution during the Indonesian National Revolution. He had served as the Central Kalimantan Governor between 1958 and 1967. While in 1960, Ovang Ore was appointed as the third Governor of West Kalimantan, becoming the first Governor of Dayak origin in the province. He held the office until 1966. He is also known as one of the founding fathers of Dayak Unity Party in 1945 and had been actively assisting the Brunei Revolt in 1962 during the height of Indonesia–Malaysia confrontation. Under Indonesia, Kalimantan is now divided into five self-autonomous provinces i.e. North, West, East, South and Central Kalimantan. 
Under Indonesia's transmigration program, which was initiated by the Dutch in 1905, settlers from densely populated Java and Madura were encouraged to settle in the Indonesian provinces of Borneo. The large-scale transmigration projects continued following Indonesian independence, causing social strains. In 2001 the Indonesian government ended the transmigration of Javanese settlement of Indonesian Borneo, during the killings of 1965–66 Dayaks killed up to 5,000 Chinese and forced survivors to flee to the coast and camps. Starvation killed thousands of Chinese children who were under eight years old. The Chinese refused to fight back, since they considered themselves a guest on other people's land", with the intention of trading only. 75,000 of the Chinese who survived were displaced, fleeing to camps where they were detained on coastal cities. The Dayak leaders were interested in cleansing the entire area of ethnic Chinese. In Ponchanak, 25,000 Chinese living in dirty, filthy conditions were stranded. They had to take baths in mud. The massacres are considered a dark chapter in recent Dayak history. From 1996 to 2003, there were violent attacks on Indonesian Madurese settlers, including executions of Madurese transmigrant communities. The violence included the 1999 Sambas riots and the Sampit conflict in 2001, in which more than 500 were killed in that year. Order was restored by the Indonesian military. Topic: Sarawak. Dayak's political representation in Sarawak compare very poorly with their organized brethren in the Indonesian side of Borneo, partly due to the personal fiefdom that was the Brook Raja Dominion, and possibly to the pattern of their historical migrations from the Indonesian part to the then pristine Rajang Basin. Reconstituted into British Crown Colony after the end of Japanese occupation in World War II, Sarawak obtained independence from the British on the 22nd of July 1963, alongside Sabah, North Borneo, on the 31st of August 1963, and would join the Federation of Malaya and Singapore to form the Federation of Malaysia on the 16th of September 1963, under the belief of being equal partners in the «marriage» as per the 18 and 20-point agreements and the Malaysia Agreement of 1963. Dayak political activism in Sarawak had its roots in the Sarawak National Party (SNAP) and Parti Pesaka Anak Sarawak (PESAKA) during post-independence construction in the 1960s. These parties shaped to a certain extent Dayak politics in the state, although never enjoying the real privileges and benefits of chief ministerial power relative to its large electorate due to their own political disunity with some Dayaks joining various political parties instead of consolidating inside one single political party. It appears that this political disunity is caused by the fact of inter-ethnic and intra-ethnic warfares among the various Dayaks ethnic groups in their past history that led to political rivalries at the loss of the whole Dayak people's power. The Dayaks need to forget their past, close ranks to unite under one umbrella party and prioritize the whole Dayak interests above all personal interests. The first Sarawak chief minister was Datuk Stephen Kalong Ninkan, who was removed as the chief minister in 1966 after court proceedings and amendments to both Sarawak state constitution and Malaysian federal constitution due to some disagreements with Malaya with regards to the 18-point agreement as conditions for the formation of Malaysia. 
Datuk Panghulu Tawi Shli was appointed as the second Sarawak chief minister who was a soft-spoken seat warmer fellow and then replaced by Tuanku Abdul Rahman Yaqub as the third Sarawak chief minister in 1970 who in turn was succeeded by Abdul Taib Mahmud in 1981 as fourth Sarawak chief minister. After Taib Mahmud resigned on 28 February 2014 to become the next Sarawak's governor, he appointed his brother-in-law, Adinan Satim, as the next Sarawak chief minister, who has in turn been succeeded by Abang Johari Open in 2017. Wave of Dayakism which is Dayak nationalism has surfaced at least twice among the Dayaks in Sarawak while they are on the opposition side of politics as follows SNAP won 18 seats with 42.70% popular vote out of total 48 seats in Sarawak state election, 1974 while the remaining 30 seats won by Sarawak National Front. PBDS Party Bansa Dayak Sarawak, a breakaway of SNAP in Sarawak state election in 1987 won 15 seats while its partner Permas only won 5 seats. Overall, the Sarawak National Front won 28 constituencies with PBB 14, SUP 11 and SNAP 3. In both cases, SNAP and PBDS now both party are defunct had joined the Malaysian National Front as the ruling coalition. Notable Dayaks Jilak Rewat, national hero of Indonesia and the first governor of central Kalimantan, Kanang Anak Langkau, national hero of Malaysia Stephen Kalong Ningkon, the first chief minister of Sarawak Leo Magi, former Malaysian federal minister Tawi Shli, the second chief minister of Sarawak Juga Barang, Malaysian politician and former minister Pandalela Rinong, Malaysian national diving athlete Joseph Kalang Thai, footballer and Malaysia national team representative Ahmad Kora, the fifth governor of Sabah Muhammad Adnan Robert, the sixth governor of Sabah Ovang Ore, third governor of West Kalimantan Cornelis M. H. The eighth governor of West Kalimantan Sugento Sabrin, the twelfth governor of Central Kalimantan Jeffrey Kitingen, President of Borneo Dayak Forum International from Sabah Joseph Perrin Kitingen, the former of the Chief Minister of Sabah Maximus Onkili, the Malaysian Minister from Sabah John Dockham, Olympic sprinter. Suhaimi Anak Salau, Bruneian football player Hami Anak Nyaring, Bruneian football player Tommy Mawat Bada, Malaysian football player. Topic. See also. Bornean traditional tattooing. Creo Dayak people and their language. Iban people and their Iban language. Maratus Dayak. Hiram M. Hiller Jr. Mina Susanna Setra